Welcome to the forum on uh, today is, let's see, May 16th, uh, 2016, the day before the election. We decided not to have a bunch of candidates come up here and say really nice things about what they plan to do because I believe pretty much everybody's got their ballot in, but I do need to say this and want to. If you haven't got your ballot in yet, please don't drop it in the mail. Please go to a drop box, and there's all kinds of drop boxes around here. Okay, moving to a really important issue in Washington County, pre preparing children for success. That's all I'm going to say about it, because today we have, from the Department of Health and Social Services, um, County Department, we have Mr. William Thomas to tell us about early childhood education. Well, Bill, please. Thanks, Rob. <clears throat> so I've been uh, asked to come here today to tell you something about what is called an early learning hub. And you say, what is that? Um, the, some of you may recall that for about 20 years, the state and county had a partnership that was called the Commission on Children and Families. And every county in Oregon had a locally appointed commission, their board of county commissioners or their county judge in Eastern Oregon would appoint, appoint these citizen groups of, of uh, folks, maybe 12 to 15 people, who were responsible for doing local planning to ensure that children uh, and their families who were from zero to 18, that they, they had services and they had supports uh, so that they could promote their wellness and their success. And when uh, Governor Kitzhaber uh, was elected in 2011, he decided that the state needed to make a much more focused effort of uh, addressing the needs of young children to be successful in school and life. And uh, <clears throat> so he wanted to change that relationship that the state had had with uh, local commissions and, and counties to make it a more focused effort on uh, the, the needs of young children from zero through six in their families. And so over the next four years, the legislature went through a number of, of bills as they kind of planned a transition from what had been these local commissions to what they are now called regional early learning hubs. In Washington County, the name of our regional early learning hub is <coughs> Early Learning Washington County. And if you see that logo up there, um, that is our, this is the cat chaser, what is this? Um, right there, uh, for Early Learning Washington County, which is a partnership between United Way of the Columbia Willamette and Washington County Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, there are 16 of these regional early learning hubs around the state of Oregon. Multnomah, Clackamas, Washington counties were all large enough that they would have a, a one county early learning hub. A few other counties, uh, Lane County also has one, but most of the other the county commissions were regionalized, so some have maybe three, four, five, six counties under one regional early learning hub. And in, in Washington County, we also have so, so we've been designated by the state of Oregon, the Department of Education, as the regional early learning hub for Washington County. Uh, we also have a grant from the Oregon Community Foundation and some other foundations to have what's al also called a parenting education hub. So our parenting education hub name is Parenting Together Washington County. So we have two hubs, one that is focused on early learning, one that is focusing on parenting education. And they're both a partnership between United Way and Washington County. Let's see. Quick. Show me how to move it. Okay. Perfect. Oh, yeah, I do. There we go. All right, so by, by uh, statute, when the state created these early learning uh, hubs, 
um, we have three goals that we pursue for, for both our uh, early learning, early childhood development, and parenting education. The state wanted to make sure that the services that were funded at the local level were um, aligned, coordinated, and effective. That means aligned that they're really moving all in the same direction. That partners who are engaged in early learning work, whether it is uh, health and human services, early childhood providers, school districts, uh, DHS, the Department of the State Department of Human Services, business partners, whomever, are moving in the same direction, that we're coordinating our services and that our services are effective, so that we're making good use of taxpayer dollars. That, more importantly, that families who are, that kids are raised in families, um, and that for kids to be successful, their families are gonna ha have to be strong and successful. The, the second goal is to make sure that families are healthy, stable, and attached. That is, they're, they're um, together as much as possible. Uh, and certainly they focus on the health of the parents as well as the health of the children. And the families have a stable place to live and uh, employment and that they remain together. And finally, that children are ready for kindergarten, ready when they when they uh, are the, have an age to go to kindergarten by the age of five at the uh, September of, of uh, the year that they're age five, and that they're reading at grade level by third grade. Now, for a program, uh, for an effort that's focused on early learning, early childhood development, you might say, well, why are we concerned about kids reading at grade level by third grade? I thought our work ends once they get to the schoolhouse doors at and, and enter kindergarten. Well, the truth is, is while the state created a, an assessment that they called a kindergarten assessment, or kindergarten, originally called kindergarten readiness assessment, nobody quite knows what that means. They know how many letters that kids can recognize, how many, how many sounds that they know, um, how their math skills are, um, and they, uh, they may know, you know, can, uh, do they have some ability to kind of self-control, pay attention, sit down in a group, raise your hands, things you have to do when you're going to a schoolroom setting for the first time. But we don't really know, well, does that mean they're gonna be successful? We do know because there have been lots and lots of studies done nationally about third grade reading scores. Third grade reading scores are one of the things that is, has been pretty well researched in terms of what happens if a kid is reading at grade level by third grade, and what happens if kids aren't reading at grade level by third grade. Kids aren't reading at grade level by third grade, it means they're gonna have a very hard time succeeding in school. It means their likelihood of dropping out of school is much higher, their likelihood of not graduating high school is much higher, their likelihood of maybe getting involved with alcohol and drugs, or criminal activities, or not being able to get a job, or not being able to form a, a stable relationship in a family themselves is much, much higher. So there's been a lot of research about third grade reading scores, and you can uh, pretty well draw a straight line between kids who are not successful at reading in, in third grade, and, and kids who don't graduate from high school and are gonna have a, a lot harder time succeeding in school and life. That's why Part one of our goals is making is doing everything we can to work with the schools, not only in handing off kids at the schoolroom door when when they enter kindergarten, but supporting schools in making sure that kids are able to read at grade level by third grade, because the chances are are significantly higher that they're going to be able to succeed in life and in school and in life if they're reading. Kids that that the the populations of kids that struggle reading at grade level by third grade are exactly the same the, the, the same populations of kids that are not successful in graduating from high school. English language learners, children with disabilities, frequently children in low-income households, frequently children <coughs> of, of color, frequently children who, are, who have unstable housing situations, who may be homeless, who may be uh, uh, refugees, who may be migrant families, who may be new immigrants, so all the same families um, who need additional help 
to make sure their kids are going to be successful need that help to make sure their kids are reading at grade level by third grade. That's why that's an important part of, of our goal here as an early learning hub. We have, So I'm going to talk to you about just a moment about our, the foundations of our, of our system, our early learning hub. And much of what I'm talking about you can find here in this one page handout that is a, is a picture of our, what we're calling our strategic framework, kind of all in one page. The goals that I just described are foundations of our, uh, of <coughs> our early learning uh, model, which include an equity lens that is focusing on making sure that that the services in the early learning system are culturally responsive and the systems are responsive to the the needs of of families uh, particularly who <coughs> may not speak English may be from uh, immigrants or refugees to reduce disparities <coughs> and higher risks for priority populations of children zero to six, six and their families. These are the same groups of kids that I just mentioned, kids with disabilities, English language learners, et cetera. We have, a, as part of our governance structure, an equity advisory council. So we, we think it's very important to focus on, on equity, ensuring that we're, we're investing to make sure that the dollars that we have go to the kids that need the most help to make sure that they're they and their families be successful. We want to make sure that we, in, we engage families to have what are called family-centered services and systems. That is really listen to what families need uh, uh, and not just kind of decide, well, this is what they're going to have, this is what they're going to get. No, we need to ask what families believe they need. Um, many, <coughs> many families, particularly low-income families in Washington County, for example, say they need family fun activities that are low cost because they, they need to be able to get out into the community and, and um, do things with their families that don't cost a lot of, uh, a lot of money because they don't have very much. Want to promote family-friendly policies and values. And we have an, a parent advisory council as part of our structure. And finally, because we have limited dollars, as, a, as our, the chair of our steering committee says, resources are always limited. We have to target those resources. We think that we're, we're more effective if we can have what are called universal strategies as it is the same strategies that we apply across the whole county to all families, but we're going to be more successful in having an impact if we can target those, those uh, limited dollars that we have on neighborhoods that have the highest needs. So we've identified about 25 of the uh, I think it's 76 elementary schools in Washington County that have uh, majorities of low-income children and majorities of children of color in, in those schools. Um, there are uh, about 10 of them in Beaverton School District, 10 in Hillsborough School District, a couple in Tucker Tualatin, uh, three in Forest Grove, and I think that's 25. And then there are also some rural areas of Washington County, particularly in, in the Sherwood, Banks and Gaston area that are more rural, uh, and in other parts of the unincorporated Washington County. So we need to be able to target our resources to be uh, effective in those uh, those areas. Um, Aloha Huber Park, uh, not far from here, is for example one of those 25 high need schools. Within those 25 schools, there are 16 that are actually have majorities of Latino children and majorities of low income children because the demographics of Washington County are rapidly changing. Uh, and we're a much more diverse county than, than uh, this county was when I grew up here. And, uh, and if you uh, aren't aware of this, Washington County has more Hispanic residents more Latino children than any county in the state of Oregon. We also have more Asian American children and families than any county in the state of Oregon. So we've, uh, we've become a very, very diverse county 
and we need to ensure that the services that are provided meet the, the respond to the diversity of our population. So now I'm just going to kind of go over quickly some of the more important um, strategies that we've been implementing in through the Early Learning Hub uh, in Washington County. There. One strategy that we have is called Healthy Families. This is a home visiting program that um, uh, supports families with children uh, from zero to three. Um, we serve about 175 families with 15 home visitors that are contracted through Community Action and LifeWorks Northwest. And this program is important because it helps families be stable by increasing their parenting skills. And this program is demonstrated <coughs> to reduce child abuse. Uh, so uh, Healthy Families is again available throughout Washington County, but we target the, the, the highest need areas with our um, uh, limited resources. Another, another strategy that we have um, been implementing is in our seven school districts, we have established uh, five early learning teams, teams of school district uh, uh, staff and community partners, whether it's community action or the libraries or the Department of Health and Human Services, um, <clears throat> to help plan early learning services in those, uh, those uh, school districts in the county. I said five because Forest Grove Banks and Gaston has one early learning team. Otherwise, we have one for Sherwood, one for Target to Wallaton, one for Hillsboro, and one for Beaverton. We've contracted with those school districts to, to hire uh, what we call family resource managers. They provide connections to resources and one-on-one -on -one family support to, ch to families with children who have uh, children up to the age of six. Some of those families may have older siblings. Uh, some of them may only, uh, only have younger children in the home. But those family resource managers are available to assist them, provide support to what resources may exist uh, that can help meet the needs of their children. These family resource managers have served over 6,000 children and families uh, annually through the seven school district. And, and this strategy helps promote school readiness as well as family health and stability because they can make contacts with families to get health insurance if they don't have it, make referrals for where they can find uh, 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 health care for their kids or um, where they, uh, the kids who might need additional assistance who have disabilities. A third, a third strategy has to do with parenting education, our, our Parenting Together Hub, um, that we provide parenting education services through classes, uh, workshops um, uh, throughout the county, uh, and, and sometimes it's even a question of, of tips. That, uh, how do you get your, parent, your kids to go to bed? Um, you know, parenting classes are a great idea but a lot of parents are, don't have the time to be able to commit to like 10 weeks at two hours and a, a, a night to go to a parenting class. They just may need to know, how do I deal with my, with my kid who's having a tantrum who, who won't eat um, or who's wetting the bed? And they, they just may need tips, and those tips are sometimes what families need to get uh, uh, a, um, uh, just a, a handle on how to best meet the needs of their children. Another um, program that we have for parenting education is, is an application that's called ROOM. Strange name. Um, we don't take responsibility for the name. But it is a, an application a, based on a phone. It's, a, it's to help families build the brains of their children. I'm going to hand out these flyers. Also, my assistant Vanna here is going to hand out some of these, uh, some I'm of these, White. some of these, this information about our family resource manager. Should have passed these out earlier, but you can see how how this room uh, application uh, uh, promotes um, activities that are that are um, brain building for kids. You can try it, download it on your phone. It'll send you uh, information every day about here's something you could do with your child in the store. 
Look at the cereal boxes, count them. Vroom is actually developed by the, by the Bezos Foundation. Uh, Jeff Bezos, of course, is the founder of Amazon. It's not intended to make all children Amazon consumers. It's intended because it's really based on a lot of science and a lot of research on what uh, uh, young children in particular need in terms of the interaction with their parents uh, to, to become more curious uh, learners and more engaged with the world. And it's a very successful, families love it. It's a, it's, a, it's a great application. So I invite you to download it for free onto your phone and try it out, see what it is. Um, our parenting education promotes family fun activities and parenting, as well as parenting classes and workshops uh, through various community-based organizations, <coughs> whether it's Youth Contact or Adelante Mujeres um, or uh, Community Action uh, or LifeWorks Northwest. And all of these strategies increase parents' knowledge and skills and strengthens positive child development. Another strategy that we have that we're just rolling out right now is a program called Preschool Promise. And this is a new program that's been funded by the legislature to fund affordable quality preschool for families up to 200% of poverty. Those of you who are familiar with Head Start may be aware that Head Start really <coughs> is a very important program, but it can only serve parents up to 100% of poverty. And the legislature created this new program to create what is more uh, of mixed income classrooms that can, these, uh, th these funds can serve children up to 200% of poverty. in affordable quality um, preschool programs. We'll serve, uh, it's, it's relatively small, we'll serve 169 four-year-olds <coughs> through child care providers, community-based organizations, Head Start providers, and school districts. We were just visiting, <coughs> when, do you, when do you know I get one of these now? We, we were just visiting with a child care provider who is the center over here on 179th and who will receive 10 slots of <coughs> preschool promise funding for four, uh, four year olds. She'll serve kids who are, no, I'm fine, thank you. She'll, she'll serve kids who are in Aloha Huber Park and um, Kinnaman Elementary Schools. And preschool promise by providing a preschool promise. Uh, experience to children who would not otherwise be able to afford preschool, uh, increases kindergarten readiness, and promotes success in school. There's two more to talk about, and then I'll be at the end and answer any questions. We've implemented a, a early kindergarten registration program. It's actually through, through the three hubs in the, in the Tri-County area, in Clackamas, Washington, and Multnomah counties. It's called Kindergarten Counts, um, that we're, we have uh, we have flyers to, to, to give out to parents um, that are available in English, Spanish, Vietnamese, Russian, Arabic, and uh, Somali and Simplified Chinese to reflect the diversity of our community. The message is all the same. The message is enroll your kid, if your child is gonna be turning five by the beginning of September, enroll them in kindergarten and do it now. Don't wait till September. Don't wait till the school bus comes by, the big yellow bus. Do it now because if you register your kids for kindergarten early, then the schools are gonna have much more information about how many kids are going to be enrolling in kindergarten in the fall, as well as which kids may have had a preschool experience and which kids haven't. So the schools can target their resources over the summer to whether it's a kindergarten uh, uh, experience or um, uh, a kindergarten readiness class. Whatever resources the school districts have can be targeted to those kids who are most in need of an extra assistance to getting ready for school. 
and you'll, uh, we have these flyers, we have PSAs in all the languages that I mentioned that are running on TVC TV and other, uh, produced by TVC TV that are, that are being um, uh, rolled out to all of the uh, commercial television stations for PSAs. And we have, there as you'll see, these bench buses. Big, Buck, Big Duck production, Productions has uh, given us 12 best bench Bus benches, thank you. Uh, you'll see them around, there's one near Costco, there's one near Renko Station, same message, same pictures, enroll your kids in kindergarten, because this gives, is, they're much more likely to succeed in school. And then the final strategy I'm going to mention is uh, a program that's called the Pax Good Behavior Game. And we've been implementing this in a number of uh, kindergarten through third grade classrooms throughout the county. Hillsborough School District is really taking this on in a big way. Um, and we have a number of schools that have adopted this program school-wide. Uh, and <clears throat> this um, is an evidence-based program to support uh, classroom management. It's by focusing on self-regulation. There's a, a, a um, growing amount of research that shows the best predictor of kids being successful in school, the kids are reading in third grade, is not that they know their ABCs when they get, enter kindergarten, but that they know how some self-control. They know how to defer gratification. There's a very famous experiment done about, about marshmallows. Just presenting kids with, young kids with a marshmallow and saying, you know, if, you'll, if you can wait five minutes, we'll give you two marshmallows. The kids that can't wait are the ones who have less self-regulation, less self-control, and there's, again, a lot of research to say, those are the kids that are gonna struggle in school. So this is a, is a, is a program where we've already trained over 300 teachers in Hillsborough, Forest Grove, Sher Sherwood, and Tiger to Wallington, and we implemented over 6,900 children. It increases on task behaviors in the classroom, it reduces disciplinary problems, and includes it, and, improves the climate of the school. Now these strategies that I mentioned are not everything that we're doing. There's some programs that I haven't mentioned, uh, such as our focused child care networks um, for Latino providers uh, and, and other things that we've been implementing. But one thing just I'll, I'll close with is, is that I would invite you to look at this sheet that we handed out, which is from a Nobel Floor Prize economist, Laurelet economist, talking about the four big benefits of investing in early childhood development. It prevents the achievement gap, it improves health outcomes, it boosts earnings of a lifetime, and it makes dollars and cents. There's a huge return on investment to invest in early childhood. And that's why the state is doing this, that's why we hope the community will partner with us in, in strengthening the services and uh, resources that are available to families to make sure that their kids can be successful when they enter kindergarten. So I leave you with that thank you and we'd be happy to answer questions. Is there questions? Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, this is a really important program and I'm sure you guys can see this. And he's got such a dedicated team, staff team. As a matter of fact, I actually love the, his staff, but that's another topic for another time. Um, well, we have questioners lining up, and just as a quick reminder, in order to ask questions, you need to be a paid-up member of the forum, and that's the commercial for now. Bill, first question. Hi, my name is Bill Kroger. I'm a forum member. Thanks for coming in today. It was an interesting program. You certainly know your program well, so thank you. I read today, and uh, Paul Krugman in the New York Times talked about uh, the U.S. was next to last, next to Estonia, in the, de in the developed nations for what we provide for our young kids that it was the U.S. really was horrible about this. Um, two areas that he specifically talked about was uh, subsidies for uh, parents to drop kids off to uh, uh, care, you know, you know, the child care centers. So the, especially the, the people that don't make a lot of money, you know, so they can afford to go to work and stuff. And the other one was uh, about uh, uh, apparently uh, parents, at least the uh, mothers, getting uh, three months of paid maternity leave so they can stay home with the kid in the early stages of life. He said that it was the investment would be a tremendous thing because 
you know, the kids grow up like you're talking about, you know, better, better, you know, control, better educated, just better citizens, and they'll pay taxes, and this will all come back to us in a great reward. I was just kind of curious what you thought about those two ideas. Well, uh, you know, we mentioned about family family policies. Paid family leave has, of course, been in the news a lot. Um, we're the only major developed nation in the world that doesn't have paid family leave. Uh, and our economy struggles as a result of that. Um, and we have more social problems down the road because we don't invest in our uh, young families and children in the early years. You know, there was an article in the Oregonian, uh, the second point about, about child care. Um, child care is very expensive. And if you are a low-income family and you have a child and you're, you have two family members earning the minimum wage, well, do the, you know, the minimum wage, even if the minimum wage were $15 an hour, which it isn't, uh, it's less than 10. I mean, think of that, 2,088 uh, hours a year, 2,088 hours a year for $10 an hour, says so $20,000 for one parent, $20,000 for another parent. It's very expensive to provide childcare uh, if you have even one child, let alone two children. So subsidies for childcare, um, more, more affordable preschool for kids who can't, whose parents can't afford preschool, would be sensible investments for this economy that would pay off, as the, uh, Mr. Heckman, Dr. Heckman points out, eightfold in the long run. We're often very short-sighted in our social policy in this country, so I think uh, Dr. Grubman makes a very good point. Hi, uh, Phil Nelson, four member. I'm concerned about the funding to know how much money statewide is being put into this program and, and uh, how much uh, you have available in your, your budget if you feel these funds are sufficient. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, the, the, the funding for the early learning hubs is really the relatively small. It's about $9 million uh, of general funds for the kind of support the local early learning, regional early learning hubs, some state funds and, and federal funds which are passed through. This new preschool promise is the kind of biggest investment the state has made in this new system. Uh, statewide, they have allocated about, about 17 million, 17 and a half million dollars for uh, this biennium for the first year preschool promise. Uh, and that will provide 1,300 uh, uh, slots or enrollment opportunities around the state. It's not very much when you, th when you look at the amount that's invested in K-12 system of, you know, five, six billion dollars a year. So we need to think about how the in investments uh, could be increased in early childhood because they will pay off so much more in the long run. But that's a problem of Oregon's tax structure. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, that's a bigger conversation for another day. Rob Solomon, forum member, and Bill, thanks for being here. My question is also about money, but in a different way, and it may reflect my na naivete, but it intrigues me that you have this partnership with the United Way. And I don't know how many other government programs pri uh, partner with other charities so directly, but I'm intrigued as to how this partnership came about. Um, it's been a very um, rewarding partnership. And, and United Way, uh, of course, it has changed its mission in recent years um, from just being a uh, kind of pass-through or funding to large organizations like the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. In this particular United Way is to focusing much more on reducing poverty, on increasing uh, uh, skills, uh, childhood success, in uh, providing more supports to families. So we're very fortunate that, that the United Way of Columbia Willamette with its, its new leadership uh, has reached out. They became in, in a partnership with Multnomah County. They also have a partnership with United Way to be the, the uh, hub for Multnomah County. It's called Early Learning Multnomah. Uh, if we called it Early Learning Washington, people would think it was Washington State. So we had to call it Early Learning Washington County. So. Um, it's a partnership that, that is much more than the sum of its two parts between county government and United Way. Uh, 
we actually half of our employees are United Way employees and half are county employees. They're, we're co-housed together in, in Hillsboro uh, and we work very closely together trying to leverage as much as possible of, of private sector resources. I, I wanted to mention one thing, there is, there is this, um, on the flip side of this strategic uh, plan framework, there's a picture of our governance structure. We have a, a steering committee which uh, by, by state statute has to require, has to involve five uh, mandated groups, business, culturally, uh, culturally specific organizations, early childhood health, hu uh, human and social services, and K-12, that's actually six. Um, so we have a kind of a very broad partnership and our partnership with United Way just fits right into that. Uh, that we can bring the public and private sectors together to work uh, to work closely and leverage where we're each strong. Um, Jim Cape, for member, you spoke about grants. Grants are subsidies paid for by the taxpayers. The certain is that every school district, Beaverton School District, Hillsborough School District, Forest Grove School District, Tiger Twalton School District, all have several employees who are supposed to be doing exactly what you're saying the county ESD or whatever it's currently called also has several employees who are supposed to be doing exactly what you're saying. The state education department has several employees who are supposed to be doing exactly what you're saying. The federal education department is, has several employees who are supposed to be doing exactly what you're saying. So instead of doing the sob story of needing more money, shouldn't there you be naming names about who isn't doing their paid job to solve these problems? Thank you. Sure. Um, well, you know, school districts in the state of Oregon are funded for K-12. K is kindergarten. They aren't funded for to do early childhood. They aren't funded to focus on on um, work of children uh, and supporting families from prenatal to children are entering kindergarten. So in that sense, um, no, there aren't. Uh, staff in school districts that are that are funded to do this. Um, the ESD does receive funding for what's called early intervention, early childhood special education, which are targeted funds for kids who have um, uh, demonstrated disabilities uh, and that um, that's they've taken on that role but uh, for, uh, for the early intervention, early childhood special education, but that's special education. As a general rule, um, the, all of the funding which comes, that's available for early childhood has either come from the federal government for Head Start, and in our county, fewer than 50% of the kids who are eligible for Head Start are actually able to uh, access uh, Head Start. So in that sense, it's not a sob story about, about who's not doing their job. It's a challenge to say, as taxpayers, if we're concerned about about ensuring that our communities are healthy and that our children are going to be successful, that we need to think about, about the priorities. That maybe it makes a lot more sense to invest in early childhood than paying for more prisons. It's a thought. Chris Leslie, four member. Thank you, Bill, again. Uh, the idea of personal responsibility of these parents and Planned Parenthood, do you have any association with groups like that? No, uh, sir, we have no, no relationship with Planned Parenthood. You don't teach personal responsibility of being able to care for your children? Well, I mean, <coughs> excuse me, all, um, all early childhood programs are focused on a recognition that, a, that a, a parent is a child's first and best teacher, and that is the personal responsibility. You know, and I think that the dilemma <clears throat> that we have as, as a society is that we can, we can recognize that, that we need to support families and we need to support from the, from the choice, you know, the first choice that's made about, do you want a child, are you ready to have a child and able to, um, to provide the, the, the environment that children need to be successful. 
But at that point, you know, then it becomes a question of, well, what does a society provide in order to ensure that future generations are going to be successful? It's always a balance between you know, individual responsibility and, and uh, the uh, collective support that, that we may provide for future generations. That's the basis that what, why we have universal public education in this country. Hi, Spencer Ehrman, forum member. Um, food and housing and security are um, huge issues in Washington County as they are everywhere these days. Um, to what extent does your program interface with organizations that um, help to solve those issues, particularly housing? Um, if a family doesn't have stable housing, the likelihood that um, they can provide any kind of education for their children is uh, almost non-existent. Um, we, of course, uh, and affordable housing is a major <coughs> growing crisis in Washington County, just because rents are, are so high right now. Uh, but that the, um, we obviously don't have any funding for affordable housing. Our family resource managers can help work with families to identify those resources that may be available for housing, for food, for clothing, for other assistance, and help get them connected with resources uh, to the, but <coughs> you know, beyond uh, trying to connect somebody with community action, for example, if they may need short-term rent assistance or utility assistance, uh, we don't have any funds that we can that we can bring to that. Sorry, Harry Bodine, for a member, uh, you know. Uh, my, our local elementary school, Ridgewood, is not on your list. But what can a private citizen do who is not, uh, say, 83 like I am, to be something constructive in this situation, personally? Personally? If uh, you can go to your local school and say, do you have a need for grandparents to come into the classroom and read to kids? Kids need tutors and they need role models. And, and the, um, those of us who are getting up in years, um, and I, I count myself in that, uh, can give back to the community in many ways to, su to support kids on a very personal basis. And so, uh, you know, the, the schools, child care center, um, that where they need to, to see older adults and interact with them and uh, to, to benefit from, you know, help and, and tutoring at any age uh, from, you know, pre-kindergarten up through high school. Thank you, Bill. Uh, William Thomas from the Washington County Early Learning Hub. Thank you very much for a very informative presentation. There weren't too many people here today, but for the 10,000 people at home, please, you're watching on YouTube, please let me take a moment not only to express appreciation for Bill and the staff and the stuff that they're doing, but I want to flag you to a forum development. We have been waiting. We had the services of a wonderful volunteer. And today, if you go and check out our website, you'll see a very brand new website. And for those of you here or at home, if you have any comments about it, feel free to just go through the website and send it back to us. We're really quite proud of what we've been able to achieve with the help of a wonderful volunteer, Rick Paulson. And next week, what do we have next week? We have a good look at folks, or not folks, pardon me, but animals that are in jeopardy, species in Washington County that are in jeopardy of being extinct. Scott Beckstead will be here to talk with us about that. And I, I guess I got a little confused. We're not talking about politicians that have become extinct. We're talking about animals that have become extinct next week. On the 30th, that's Memorial Day. We will not have a, a session here today, a program on the 30th. And on the 6th, for those of you that haven't seen it or heard about it yet, we, I appreciate the comments about older folks and those of us who are 60s, 70s, 80s, and even 90s will feel good because our presenter is somewhere in the neighborhood of 190 years old. President Abraham Lincoln will be here on um, uh, the 6th of June. And for those of you, again, that aren't aware, it is a press conference in 1865. 
He will share 20 to 30 minutes of what's going on. I, I hear some rumors about a civil war that doesn't involve Marvel Comics. And at any rate, he will be there talking for about 30 minutes, and then this becomes a press conference, a scrum, and forum members, yeah, you got to be paid up. I know, it's one more hit from us, but forum members get to ask questions about 1865. There is no way you're going to trump this gentleman, or for that matter, even bring up Clinton's, because neither of those folks, families for that matter, were politically active. They may have been alive, I'm not going to say that, but they weren't around at that time. We're looking forward to the presentation on the 6th. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to once again thank Mr. Thomas and close for today. Thank you so much. <laughs>